G'day and welcome to Good Life at Your Place. My name's Dave and with my wife Rebecca, we are the senior pastors of this brilliant family of churches and uh, hopefully you're near one of our campuses and if you are, there's nothing like getting to the building. We're about to join in with worship right here and right now, but I want to encourage you, if and when you can, make every effort to be with the team, with the family. There's nothing like worshipping in the church building with the team. And I tell you what, it's such an experience of connecting with God and doing it alongside your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we've got campuses at Toronto and at Maitland, Foster Tunkari and at Newcastle. But no matter where you're at, I'm so glad that you've joined us. And so let's get into worship right now. You know, whatever you're feeling today, whatever circumstance you're facing, God is in it. He has not left you. You are loved. You have been claimed. You have been called by Him, the Lord of the universe. So as we worship, let's seek His presence. Let's open our hearts and focus our attention on Him. Lord, we lift you up. I've been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every bend. I've held everything together and watched it shatter. Stood tall and I have crumbled in the sun. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender. Chased my heart adrift and drifted home again. Plundered blessings till I've been desperate to find redemption. Every time I turn around, Lord, you're still there. I was found before I was lost. I was yours before I was known. Grace to spare for all. It's a grace I could never add up to be somebody you still want, but somehow you love me as you found. Oh, 
this kind of love so how this kind of love is who you are it's a grace i could never add up to be somebody you still want but so you love me as you find What a great opportunity we have to worship our God. I'm so glad that you've joined us here for this. Hey, um, if you're new, if this is your first time with us, we would love to get in contact with you and get to know you just a little bit. And so all we're asking you to do is go to our website, take the step, jump online, go to goodlifechurch.com.au and uh, go to the I'm new button or the next steps button and we can let you know what's next. Uh, some of the locals in the campus closest to you would love to be in contact with you and help you on your journey. If you have any questions or uh, if you have any need for any support, any prayer needs, that is the place to go and we would love to uh, stand alongside you and believe God with you for victory in every and any area of life. Hey, every week at Good Life Church, we have the opportunity to bring an offering to God and it goes to the work of local church. And finance is an interesting subject in the Bible. It's actually mentioned a lot. It's one in four verses in the gospel. So the four gospel accounts of the life of Jesus, one in four verses, Jesus speaking or the story covering areas of finance, stewardship, resources, generosity, one in four verses. And Jesus even says, wherever your treasure is, there is your heart. This is a concept that's all the way through the Bible. And it starts right with Abraham, who's the father of faith that starts right at the start. Well, not right, right at the start, but in Genesis. And uh, that, that, that I, I suppose that uh, concept of generosity, that concept of these resources that are in my hands, God gave me the breath in my lungs and the good grace to be able to make finance and to be able to take care of my family, but also that that always has for every believer a part to play in generosity towards the kingdom of God that goes through the work of local church. Abraham knew it. It's all through the Old Testament. Every time that there was a time for an offering, people came and brought a free will offering because they believed in worship to their God and they believed for the forward momentum of God's kingdom through their generosity all the way through the Old Testament, prophets, Psalms, kings, everywhere. New Testament, Jesus says, look, don't forsake the tithe, but make sure you understand generosity. The New Testament church is filled with wild generosity. And I tell you what, it's a journey to understand this pathway of generosity to God's kingdom through the local church. And I would encourage you as a believer, never miss out on this amazing adventure. It's a life of faith and adventure which you can get no other way. It's a trust in God. When I bring an offering to God through the work of local church, it's my trust to God put on show. And when I sow, the Bible says, I'm gonna reap. When do I reap? Don't know, but I'm putting it in God's hands. How am I gonna reap? don't know, but I'm going to put it in God's hands. When you give, it's a big faith statement of trust. Now, an extra kicker, an extra benefit is all the good that happens on planet Earth through the local church, through Good Life Church. So I want to say thank you to every person who gives consistently of tithes and offerings. It's an important part to play and you're making a way for someone else to hear the gospel and for hearts and lives to be changed, transformed. Uh, everywhere there is a Good Life Church. So God bless you. All the uh, opportunities, all the options of giving are listed on the screen. You just go for it. We're standing with you in faith for a great harvest in your life and we're appreciating every giver as you do it. God bless you as you do. Hey, uh, we're gonna go straight to the Good Life Update, which lets you know all the cool things that are happening at Good Life Church right near you. And then straight after that, we're going to the Word of God. So when you get to that, lean in, grab your notes, learn lots, open hearts, Hearted. Let's not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. Let's go for it. Hey guys, my name is Luke and here's the Good Life Update, where we let you know everything coming up in the life of our church.
It's Heart for the House season, and we're full of faith as we sow into the forward momentum of Good Life Church. This week, each campus has their very own all-in where we can bring our faith commitment or offering. So, Monday, Foster Tongue Curry, you've got your all-in. Tuesday, Maitland, Wednesday, Newcastle, and Thursday at Toronto. Make sure you RSVP at goodlifechurch.com.au. Growth Track is happening this weekend at your local campus. Head along to discover purpose and find out where you can make a difference by joining a dream team. If you want to know more information, see one of our team or head to the Yes Desk after the service. That's all from me today. Make sure you follow your campus on social media and we'll see you here next weekend. Okay, I'm here tonight. We're going to talk about crazy faith. Crazy faith. When I was a kid, there was a woman in our church named Marie, and I loved Marie. Um, she was a wonderful woman. She was a wife. She was a mum. She was a grandma. And Marie also had multiple sclerosis. And as a kid, I didn't really know what MS meant. All I knew is that Marie was in a wheelchair and her house had lots of ramps. But as I grew older, I began to understand more about the disease and how it impacted her everyday life. And Marie was actually an amazing Bible teacher. And so we would get her, or my, not me, my parents, <laughs> would get her to, to preach at our church regularly. And there's this one day, this one message that she shared that I will never forget. I was about 14 years old. And I was old enough by this stage to understand MS and what it was doing to her body. And Marie and my mum were really close friends. And so I had witnessed her struggle close up. And... So many people seemed to have opinions as to why she hadn't been healed. This was the 80s and the early 90s, and that back then it was like, you just don't have enough faith. And some really harsh words were said to her as to why she hadn't been healed. But I had been with her when we went to these healing crusades with these various American famous preachers. And night after night, she would go forward for healing, believing that tonight was going to be the night, believing that tonight was the night for her miracle. And I knew she had faith. I knew because she was believing for it. She was praying for it. And I remember one moment really vividly. The altar call was given and Marie was kind of in the aisle there because she was in a wheelchair and I was about three, four seats along. And in the middle of this altar call, she just suddenly stood up from her wheelchair and just stood with her arms raised like this in worship to God. And I, my heart just stopped. I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is it. She's just been healed. And then she just fell flat on her face because her legs gave way. And then she couldn't get up. She was stuck on the floor. And her husband and my dad had to lift her back up and put her in the wheelchair while she just silently just wept. In Hebrews 11, we have this famous faith chapter. And uh, some of us can even quote verse 1 by heart. But verse 2 was the one that struck my eye when I was preparing this message. Verse 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And when I read that second verse, Marie is the person who comes to mind. This is what the ancients were commended for. Because if I think about that day when I was 14 years old and she was sharing at church, what I remember from that day is this one verse that she read. It was from Job chapter 13, verse 15, where it says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And there was just this moment where she looked up and she kind of eyeballed everyone in the, in the room. It was a moment I will never forget. And she said it again, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Now, she wasn't saying that God had given her MS. She wasn't saying that God was killing her. What she was saying was, even if I don't get healed, even if what I'm believing for and praying for and hoping for never comes to pass, even if I die with this disease, yet will I trust Him. And I realised in that moment at 14 years old that this is what faith looks like. This is what the ancients were commended for. And so Marie was my first picture of what faith looks like. And she made a lifelong impact on my life, as you can tell. She also made a lifelong impact on the nurses and the carers who became Christians as they worked with her and helped her. So she was actually not healed this side of heaven, but her life was a testimony of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And there are people who are Christians today because of her. And so the disease that she battled, God did not give to her, but He used it so that others would find Jesus. 
And I don't know why she didn't get her miracle this side of eternity. I don't know why she didn't get healed. But I do know that God is faithful because she is in the presence of Jesus right now. She is one of the great cloud of witnesses that are cheering us on. She is whole and she is healed and she will be for all eternity. And I can't wait to thank her for the way that her life of faith impacted me. Because this is faith. This is what the ancients were commended for. Yet will I trust Him. And so I want to talk tonight about what does it look like to have that kind of crazy faith. And if we look deeper at Hebrews 11, it's kind of like the hall of fame of faith, right? It talks the whole chapters about faith and these amazing people and what they did. But I want to look at, okay, what can we learn from these people? What can we put into practice in our lives so that we can be like them, so that we can have the faith that the ancients were commended for? And so it's really simple. I've got three simple points. Super simple. Not always easy to do though. Point number one is believe God. So simple. Believe God. That's not deep. (laughs) Believe God. But yet this can be the hardest thing of all, right? Because how do you believe God when the circumstances are screaming the opposite? How do you do that? The person who's mentioned the most in Hebrews 11 is Abraham. So I want to kind of hone in on him for a little bit and have a look. So he is 75 years old. His wife is 65 years old. Her name's Sarah. And they're not able to have children. And so what that means is they've actually struggled with the heartache of infertility over decades of married life. Abraham's father and his brother have both died. And so we have Abraham and Sarah. They're childless, they're aging, and they're grieving. And God speaks. And God says, go. Go to a land that you don't know. Go to a land that I will show you. And I'm going to give you children. In fact, I'm going to make your descendants a great nation. Now, I just want you to forget for a second that you know the end of the story. It's too easy sometimes if we read the Bible because we know what's going to happen. And so we skip over the fact. So just put yourself in Abraham's shoes for a second. You're 75. Your wife is 65. You've had a lifetime of infertility and there's no IVF, there's no adoption agencies, no fertility treatments available. And then God says, I want you to go to a land that you do not know, that I'll show you. And you don't have maps, you don't have a GPS, there's no Google Maps so you can look out the suburb you want to live in. You have no idea even where you're going because God goes, I'll show you. You'll know when you get there. (laughs) Would you believe God in that circumstance? Like seriously, I don't know if I would. And yet Abraham does. He believed God. But then years go by, like literally years, 24 years. That's older than half the people in the room. 24 (laughs) 24 years go by. Abraham is 99 years old. Sarah is 89. And just this is a true story, okay? When you're reading the Bible, understand these are true stories. So don't kind of pass it off and go, oh, well, whatever. No, no, no. This This was a person, okay? This was a person with emotions and feelings who's walking this road. And he's 99. And God said, you're going to have kids. And he's like, I'm 99. (laughs) My wife is 89. (laughs) But God appears again and makes a promise. I'm going to give you descendants and your descendants are going to be a great nation. Again, forget that we know the end of the story. How would you react? To be honest, I would be feeling like going, God, you said this 24 years ago, and I was old then. Like, but Abraham's response, he falls on his face before God and worships. That's faith. And then finally, Abraham's 100 years old, Sarah's 90 years old, and she gives birth to their baby miracle, their miracle baby Isaac. God was faithful. God was true. God's promise came to pass. But here's the key, and here's the thing that is so simple, but so profound and so hard to do. Abraham believed God. Full stop. Genesis 15 verse 6 says, Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him him as righteousness. So in the face of old age, in the face of infertility and barrenness, in the face of impossibility, Abraham chose to believe what God said. So if we're going to talk crazy faith tonight, crazy faith means believing God's Word. You know, Paul calls Abraham the father of us all. And he says this about Abraham in Romans 4 verse 18. He says, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. 
Another version says, hope against hope, Abraham in hope believed. In other words, there was no reason to hope and yet he had hope anyway. And so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God. Good life, we need to be in a place where we believe the Word of God. And I love what it says about Abraham here. It says, without weakening in his faith, he faced the facts. In other words, Abraham wasn't in denial, okay? He faced the facts, but he didn't weaken in his faith. He didn't waver in unbelief. He was strengthened in his faith. He gave glory to God and he was fully persuaded that God could do what he had promised. Believe God. So easy to say and so hard to do. So how do we do it? I think the answer for me is found in that father that brings his child to Jesus for healing. And this little kid is demon possessed and he wants Jesus to heal his child. And Jesus kind of goes, well, do you believe? Do you believe? And this dad says, Lord, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I think that's the key. Let's face the facts, but never waver. Don't live in denial, but don't waver in your faith. And when you feel your strength fade, when you feel your faith is slipping, cry out to God, Lord, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Make a statement, make a stand in the Spirit. God, I choose to believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Let's allow the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, fill us and enable us and strengthen us to believe again. In a world of sceptics, in a world of cynics, let's be the ones who take God at His Word. Let's believe God, because that is crazy faith. Number two, earnestly seek Him. Hebrews 11, 5 and 6 says this, By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he, in other words, he didn't die. That's what it's saying. Before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. And if you look in the book of Genesis, the way that Enoch's life is described, it says that Enoch walked faithfully with God. In fact, two times in two verses, it says Enoch walked faithfully with God. It wasn't complicated. He just walked faithfully with God. He lived his life in the presence of God. And I think sometimes this is really hard. I mean, it is for me. (laughs) Because there's so many demands on my time that pull my attention, right? There's so many convenient distractions that interrupt me when I spend, set aside time to spend with God and there's these convenient distractions. There's voices, there's emails, there's messages, there's devices, there's social media posts, there's news stories and they pull my focus off Him. And so when my eyes should be on Him and Him alone, I find myself distracted. Anyone with me? Anyone going to be honest tonight and go, yep, we're all the same. <laughs> but He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Sometimes we are so worried about all these things that we forget to seek first Him, His kingdom, His righteousness. Because when we do that, He takes care of all these things. It's not my problem anymore. My problem, seek Him. He takes care of that. Because I can't fix this. Right? When I'm focused on this, all I can think of is how bad everything is and how out of control it seems. And I'm in control freak. I want to be in control and I'm not in control. And so it's terrible. Seek Him. Being honest. (laughs) Seek Him. And then I can just go, oh, not my problem. Actually, not my problem anymore. It's God's. Sometimes everything just screams so loud though. The work, the kids, the pressures, the expectations, your boss, whatever it might be, your wife, hopefully she's not screaming all the time. But sometimes everything's screaming so loud that we miss the still small voice. 
We miss the whisper of God. We miss the whisper of the Holy Spirit who's directing us, who's guiding us, who wants to give us wisdom for those tough situations. We miss that moment where God's going, hey, I've got an answer for you here. Will you just listen for a second? Just listen. The Holy Spirit is here and He wants to talk. He wants to whisper into your heart. But we're so distracted by the screams. Let's listen to the whisper. Earnestly seek Him. That whisper is asking us to seek first His kingdom and walk faithfully with our God. So again, how do you do it? Years ago, I read a book called Good Morning, Holy Spirit. And in this book, the author would literally start his day by saying those words. He'd wake up and say, good morning, Holy Spirit. And it would just centre his whole day around the presence of God. And it began a conversation with the Holy Spirit that would continue throughout his day. And so I thought, I'm going to try this. I began to do it. Waking up in the morning and just saying, good morning, Holy Spirit. So simple. But the difference it made in my day, incredible. Because I was more aware of His presence all day. Then if I missed it, I, I would just go through my day. But when I would do it, I'd start in that moment. I'd just still my soul for a moment, go, good morning, Holy Spirit. And then all day I'd be listening for His voice. All day I was aware of His presence. All day I found myself talking to Him, asking for His wisdom, asking for His guidance. And I was even more aware of people around me and their needs and what God wanted to do for them and through them and in them and how He could use me to bless other people. I became more aware of God's love for people around me. And I feel like this is what Enoch did. He just started his day with God and then walked with Him all day. So simple. Whether you're at work or you're at home, you're listening for the whisper of the Holy Spirit. On the good days and the bad days, you're asking for His strength. In high pressure situations, praying a silent prayer, asking for God's wisdom before you open your mouth, allowing Him to be part of every moment of every day. He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. That's crazy faith. Number three is act. Hebrews 11 is full of the actions and the obedience of people with crazy faith. Abel brought an offering. Enoch walked with God. Noah built an ark. Abraham left his home to go to a strange land. Moses led the people through the Red Sea. And then in the words of the writer of Hebrews in verse 32, he says this, I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised their life again. Then it takes a turn. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sword in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. We need to understand the faith walk doesn't look like everything going right all the time. Don't assume that because things are going wrong, you don't have faith. Okay, you've got two groups of people here. Some of them saw all these amazing miracles and some didn't, but they were still walking the walk of faith. And crazy faith looks like action. These incredible heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, we see their faith by their obedience. We see their faith by their acts. James puts it this way in Chapter two, verse, uh, James chapter 2, verse 17, he says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. A couple of verses on, talking about Abraham, he says, You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Faith without action is not faith, because our actions come out of our faith. Our faith is revealed by what we do. But the faith act or the faith action can look different. And so I just want to mention three different kinds of act of faith. Sometimes the act of faith is just the simple, small, faithful step. Eugene Peterson, who gave us the message paraphrase, called it this, a long obedience in the same direction. I like that. This is where the act of faith just looks like quiet faithfulness, like obedience in the daily disciplines, the act of faith of reading our Bible, the act of faith of praying throughout your day, the act of faith of praying for loved ones who don't know Jesus, the act of faith of prioritising church on Sundays, which you have done today, that is an act of faith. 
The act of faith of bringing your tithes and your offerings into the house of God. The act of faith of being faithful in your marriage. The act of faith of a soft answer turning away wrath. The act of faith of not being a gossip. The act of faith of serving on team. See, it's a long obedience in the same direction. It's the small, faithful steps of a life that is submitted to God. This is the act of faith. The second kind of faith act is difficult obedience. This is the act of faith in making that tough decision. The act of faith of obeying when it hurts. Moses left the palace to wander in the desert. Joseph, Jeremiah, Peter, Paul and countless others chose to trust God through the captivity of prison bars. Hebrews 11, we just read it, tells of people who were tortured and flogged and stoned to death and yet they stayed true to their Saviour. Sometimes the obedience is hard. Sometimes the act of faith hurts. Often the act of faith that hurts looks like forgiving someone who doesn't deserve forgiveness. And I just want to touch on this for just a second because forgiveness, again, is one of those things that is easily talked about but very difficult to do. And yet forgiveness brings healing to ourselves, right? Forgiveness is the act of faith that sets us free. During World War II, there was a woman living in Holland named Corrie ten Boom. And after Nazi Germany took power in Holland, Corrie and her family began hiding Jews in a secret room in their house and then it helped them escape out of Nazi-occupied territory. And over two years, the ten Boom family hid over 800 Jewish people, saving their lives. But in February 1944, the family was betrayed and arrested. Corrie's elderly father, Caspar, lasted only 10 days in prison before he passed away. Corrie and her sister, Betsy, were sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp in Germany. And the sisters, as you can imagine, suffered terribly at at the concentration camp. And Betsy actually died at Ravensbrück. A year and a half in the concentration camp. Enduring the horrors day after day in that place, Corrie was eventually released at the end of the war. And she began to travel through Europe preaching the gospel. And she particularly preached about forgiveness because in post-war Europe, everyone had someone to forgive. And Corrie would preach that healing was linked to forgiveness. But one day she herself was put to the test. It was 1947. It was only two years after her release from the concentration camp. And she's speaking in a church in Germany, in Munich. And at the end of the service, a man in a grey overcoat came up to her. And she froze because she knew this man. She knew him well. He had been one of the most vicious guards at Ravensbrook. He was one of the ones who would mock the women prisoners as they showered. And she said it all came back with a rush, this huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the centre of the floor and the shame of having to walk naked past this man. And now he was pushing out his hand to shake mine, saying, a fine message, Fraulein, how good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And she said, I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my handbag because I couldn't take his hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. But since that time, he said, I've become a Christian and I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein, and he put his hand out again, will you forgive me? And I stood there, I whose sins had been forgiven again and again by God, and I could not forgive. My sister Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply by asking? The soldier stood there expectantly, waiting for me to shake his hand. And I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. Because the message that God forgives us has a prior prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. Standing there before the former Nazi guard, 
Kari remembered that forgiveness is an act of the will, not an emotion. Jesus, help me, she prayed. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. God, you've got to supply the feeling. And so she thrust out her hand. And she said, as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder and it raced down my arm and it sprang into our joined hands. And this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, with all of my heart, I cried. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I have never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even so, I realised it was not my love. I had tried and I did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that Corrie's story is for someone here today. It's time to forgive. And maybe you've tried to do it in your own strength and you just can't. But the Holy Spirit will give you the power and He will bring the healing as a result. Don't try and do it in your own strength because you just can't. Lean to the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to give you the strength to forgive. Allow Him to enable you to do it. And He'll bring healing to your soul as you do. So sometimes that act of faith looks like forgiveness. Sometimes that act of faith hurts. But that act of faith is the very thing that brings healing to our heart, brings breakthrough to our heart. And the third type of act of faith, sometimes the act of faith looks like a leap of faith. Peter jumped out of the boat and walked on water. (laughs) The four friends of the paralyzed man took apart a roof, not their roof, some some other person's roof, and lowered their friend down into the house where Jesus was and their friend was healed. Israel marched around a city and the walls came down. Moses lifted his arms out over the Red Sea and the water parted so that Israel could walk across on dry ground. You see, sometimes God asks us to do something big. When I was 21 years old, I moved to Australia on my own to go to Bible college because God had asked me. Little did I know that the plan of God for my entire life was waiting on the other side of that act of obedience. A few years ago through during Good Life's Heart for the House season, God asked Dave and I to jump out of the boat with our giving. And we were going through a really, really, really hard time. And over months and months and months, the situation just got worse and worse. And we were praying for a miracle. We were believing for a miracle, but nothing, no miracle was coming. In fact, it was getting worse. The situation was getting worse and we had no way out. And so we chose to obey and it was really scary. But we chose to obey and we gave sacrificially into the heart for the house offering. And literally out of the blue, the breakthrough came. Like out of the blue. It was a phone call I'd made a million times before trying to solve the situation. And then suddenly someone said, oh yeah, that's easy. And just fixed the whole, and the whole thing just disappeared. It wasn't even that we had to sort it out a better way. No, it just disappeared. The whole situation that had been 10 months of, of stress and heartache, God just removed it like that. But we had to actually jump out of the boat with our giving. And it can be scary. My husband rang me on the way to church tonight. He's out at Maitland. And he said, have you uh, heard from God about Heart for the House offering yet? I said, nope. He goes, okay, you need to pray because I've got something. I went, what have you got? And he goes, I'm not telling you. I went, oh, no. I said, is it more than last year? Because we felt like last year was like sacrificial, like a big faith give. He goes, yep. I'm like, okay. (laughs) So I get it, right? But if it's an act of faith, it's an act of faith. God's in control. My life, my provision does not come from me. It comes from God. If I can't trust God with that, what can I trust Him with? Sometimes your act of faith looks like getting on a plane to another country. Sometimes your act of faith looks like giving a heart for the house offering that hurts or scares you. Maybe it doesn't hurt, it just scares you. Sometimes your act of faith looks like jumping out of a boat or breaking through a roof. Not this roof, please. Or marching around a city. I don't know what your act of faith is going to look like, but sometimes God asks us to do something big. Let's be open to that because there's breakthrough on the other side of our obedience. There's miracles on the other side of our obedience. I'm going to ask the team to join me on stage. I just want you to imagine for a moment what a life of faith looks like. A life of believing God's Word. A lifetime of believing His promises. A lifetime of earnestly seeking Him. Seeking His kingdom and His righteousness above all else. A life of small faithful steps. 
a life of a long obedience in the same direction, a life of obedience even when it's tough, a lifetime of obeying when it hurts, a life of the big acts of faith, of jumping out of the boat or taking a city. The final hero of faith I want to look at today is a guy who lived that life of faith. He was a guy who believed the promises of God. He walked faithfully with God in the small and the big, on the easy days and on the hard days. And his name was Caleb. So Caleb was one of the Israelite slaves in Egypt. And he came out of Egypt under Moses. He was there during the plagues of Egypt. He was there when the Red Sea parted. And when Moses sent the 12 spies into the promised land to spy out the land and bring back a report, he was one of the ones who went. Him and his good friend Joshua were one of the, or two of the 12 spies that went out. The other 10 spies came back full of fear, full of defeat, ready to stone Moses and head back to Egypt, back to slavery. They decided that slavery was better than this land that they were going into because they were so afraid. But Caleb and Joshua brought a good report. And Caleb declared to the people of Israel, the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of the people of the land. Because Caleb believed the promise of God and he was ready to act on it. But the rest of the nation rebelled against God and they refused to go into the land. And so God decreed that they would wander in the desert, in the wilderness for 40 years until every single one of the adults that came out of Egypt had passed away, except Joshua and Caleb. So we're going to fast forward 45 years, 45 years. And finally, Israel has conquered Canaan. And Caleb is ready. He is more than ready. He's been waiting 45 years for this. And in Joshua 14 verse 6, Caleb speaks with his old friend Joshua. It says, Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, a servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, He has kept me alive for 45 years since the time He said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as He said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Canaanite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Here's what I want you to see here. This is a life of faith. I mentioned earlier that the first step in a life of faith is believing what God says. And four times in that passage that I just read, Caleb refers to the Word of the Lord or the promise of God. He believes what God has said. Even though it was 45 years ago, He believes what God said because this is the life of faith. And then we talked about earnestly seeking God, about walking with Him faithfully. And in that passage I read three times, it refers to Caleb following the Lord wholeheartedly, following God with his whole heart. Because again, this is the life of faith. And then we talked about action, about obedience, taking the small steps, the tough steps, the big steps of faith. And Caleb starts to speak about his actions of the past, spying out the land, bringing back a good report to Moses. And then he speaks of his future actions, of his desire to possess the land that God had promised, of his readiness for battle with the Lord's help, of his commitment to drive out the inhabitants of the land as, a land as God had promised. Caleb's obedience in the past opened up the door for the blessing and the protection of God. And Caleb's future obedience opened the door to possessing the inheritance that God had promised. This is the life of faith. I'm going to ask you to stand for a moment. Just close your eyes. Holy Spirit, 
just lean into the presence of God right now. Still your mind, still your heart. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Because Caleb's life of faith is what God wants for all of us. That as we believe God's Word, as we earnestly seek Him, as we act in faith, that we'll be like Caleb. Caleb in his youth and Caleb in his old age, full of faith, full of anticipation for what God is doing, ready for whatever God asks of us. My prayer is that each and every one of us would get to 85 years old and say along with Caleb, I followed my God wholeheartedly. I am still strong. The Lord has promised me. The Lord will help me. 85 and still full of faith for a promise that was given 45 years before. Still excited, still excited about the things of God, still following the the Spirit of the Lord, still walking with God wholeheartedly. You see, crazy faith is not actually crazy. It's just what walking with Jesus looks like. Believe His Word. Earnestly seek Him. Act in faith. When God talks about Caleb in Numbers chapter 14, God says this, My servant Caleb has a different spirit and he follows me wholeheartedly. And because of that, I will bring him into the land. My servant Caleb has a different spirit and he follows me wholeheartedly. You know, Good Life Church, we have a different spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. He has been poured out. He's here right now. He's speaking to every heart. And I believe there was something in that message that just was for you. Might be different for every person. Maybe you're standing here right now and you go, I need to forgive that person. My breakthrough is on the other side of my forgiveness. My healing is on the other side of that forgiveness. And if you're honest, you can't do it on your own. And you know what? That's the whole point. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you, God has given promises and you're struggling to believe them. You're struggling to still have hope. Maybe it's been a few years. Maybe the the thing that you're believing for is just looks like it's going in the opposite direction from what God promised. You just need the Holy Spirit to fill you to believe again. Some of you are so weighed down by distractions or stresses or pressure of the world that you're struggling to actually earnestly seek God. And every time you try to earnestly seek God, it seems like everything else just screams louder. The Holy Spirit's here. He wants to touch your heart. He wants to whisper into your spirit. He wants to bring you peace. Well, I told you the Word of God would be good. I'm hoping that you took notes, but let's be the kind of people that don't just hear something and not do it. Faith without works is dead. So I want to encourage you to be that person that leans in with faith to make an action plan. God, I'm asking you, change my heart. Here's my heart, it's yours. Be transforming my heart. And then from that, I'm ready to take some steps of faith. So God bless you as you do that. If we can help you, uh, any of the team at Good Life Church can help you in that journey. It would be our honor. And uh, you can either rock up to a Good Life Church campus anywhere near you. It's always, it's always a great idea to get there to the building with the church family if and when you can. Um, but if, if you're nowhere near one of our campuses, just go online to, uh, to goodlifechurch.com.au. Find the steps towards next steps or I'm you. Let us know how we can support you in that journey. It would be our honor. We are so glad that you've joined us. We're hoping you have an awesome week coming up, walking in the grace and the power of God for you to receive the message of Jesus Christ and then to be the message of Jesus Christ as you want to live the good life, be the church and unleash more good. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.